The biggest betrayal is the betrayal of all these Western governments and structures that have been talking to us about democracy and human rights for the last 70 years. And now they are turning a blind eye to what Israel is doing to us. The war crime of ethnic cleansing, the war crime of collective punishment, and the war crime of genocide. Joining Center Stage today is Mustafa Berghouti, Secretary General and co-founder of the Palestinian National Initiative and a long-serving member of the Palestinian Central Council. Berghouti talks about his life under Israeli oppression, the realities of an occupation, and hints at his political future. Dr. Mustafa Berghouti, welcome to Center Stage. Thank you. In 75 years of struggle, uh, for those who have short memory or for those who don't know, what do you think are the main pictures uh, the world should never forget about the Palestinian struggle? The most important in picture that we should show to the world that we are equal human beings. Mm -hmm. Not only, I mean, not that we are victims. Of course we are victims of this occupation and this should be shown. But also that we are human beings determined to get freedom, mm. powerful, strong, and insistent on, the, on getting their rights. I think that's the image that influences the world most. Mm -hmm. Combining it also with all the facts and videos and pictures of what the Israelis are doing, of all the atrocities, the acts of genocide, etc., etc., but constantly showing the Palestinian as a capable human being who is ready to struggle for their rights. I think that is a very effective way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think with the social media, you, you, what, what we lack in comparison to the Zionist establishment is that they are very well organized. Mm -hmm. And second, uh, they have very consistent and uh, messaging that uh, that is done consistently by everybody whether you talk about their embassies or their spokespersons or the army or the media outlets or their journalists or those people who are interviewed by different communication channels they have one consistent message mm. i tried to do that in 2007 when i was minister of communication and information in palestine only for a short period of 86 days in the national unity government and it was very successful because we had every morning at 7 a.m a very clear message about the reality about what's happening and we sent it everywhere mm -hmm. and i think that was one of the most successful periods what we need now is a palestinian structure mm -hmm. that helps organize our messaging and that gets out a unified message every day I mean, this is what we need. What is stopping Palestinians from this? You don't lack uh, academic uh, knowledge. You have uh, one of the highest rates of high education in the Arab world. And I think in the world as well, uh, you're very highly educated uh, people. You, are, you have uh, a lot of people who are passionate about the cause. They're not like living their life and uh, not actually considering that this is a daily struggle for them. So what is missing for this Who kind thinks? of organization? What's missing are two things in comparison to what Israelis have, is the organization. Mm -hmm. In their case, they have an establishment called Israel, mm. the official state of Israel, and they are running the show. Mm. In our case, the Palestinian official establishment is not doing anything, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And during this war, for four months of the war, we didn't see, there is no media structure. Mm. So we have to rely on ourselves, on civil society, mm. and on the people, on the grassroots. Uh, but to achieve better level of what we do, we need better organization. And that's what we are trying to work on. And of course, we lack resources. Mm. They have huge resources in comparison with, with our case, where much of what is done is done by individuals and uh, in their own time and, uh, and uh, by their own efforts, which is great because it's a grassroots popular movement in a way. Mm. But it's not enough. Let's go back to explaining Palestine to those who don't really understand what it means. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, even those who are really moved by human rights and who are advocating for it, you will not ne we will never know apartheid what it means until you live it, until you've been there, until you've seen it with your own eyes. You have, you have your own specific experience. You were born in Jerusalem. It's your hometown. You worked uh, there uh, for 15 years as a doctor. 
And now you are banned from entering Jerusalem, from living in it, from working in it. How do they do that? Like, how do they impose these uh, limitations of movement, of living in your hometown, on meeting your family? What, people, what Israel tried to do after Oslo agreement is to present the situation as if there is a Palestinian government and uh, that, that the occupation is not there. That's not true. Of course, we are under Israeli military occupation all the time, especially now after the 7th of October. Even these little spots which were under the Palestinian Authority are gone. Mm -hmm. The army is everywhere. Israel created a system of uh, dividing the West Bank and, of course, before that, Gaza, into clusters of ghettos. Mm -hmm. We have 654 military checkpoints, and these checkpoints prevent people from moving from one area to another. They can be closed, they can be open according to their wishes. For instance, now after the 7th of October, most of these 654 checkpoints are closed. In the case of Jerusalem, it is surrounded by gates and a wall. They built a wall in 2002, which separated almost 18% of the Palestinian territory in the West Bank from the rest of it, but also isolated Jerusalem completely. That's why you cannot cross to Jerusalem unless you go through these checkpoints. And that's where they decide whether you should be allowed in or not. 95% of Palestinians are not allowed now to go to Jerusalem. But there are particular cases, like my case, that even when they allow people, for instance, to go and pray in the Aqsa Mosque, if they are above a certain age, I am still not allowed. They have this kind of uh, prohibiting list. And one very interesting experience happened in, in 2005 when I ran for president. And during the presidential campaign, each time I went to Jerusalem to talk to the voters who will be voting, they arrest me. Mm. because they had an undeclared policy of preventing any election campaigning in East Jerusalem. So first time they arrested me, I came back again, they arrested me four times. Even one time when I had a permit, they sent me a permit to meet Jimmy Carter, mm. who was uh, observing our elections. And I went to see him in, and I had a permit in my hand, uh, sent by them, I didn't ask for it. When I met with, after I met with him, I told him, now I'm going to the old city and I'll see what happens. They might arrest me. And sure enough, they were waiting for me at the gates. But because they sent a permit, they couldn't arrest me. Mm. So they kidnapped me, literally. They took me to uh, a basement in a house in West Jerusalem and kept me there for five hours. And then they deported me to... No. To, to Ramallah. So th this is the kind of behavior. They behave mm. in a lawless uh, approach. Mm. They don't respect any law, even their own laws. And uh, they just do what they want to do. Mm. And this is the nature of what we live in. And I think the message we should send to the world is also to expose the nature of this apartheid racist system by Israel. To explain, that's the most difficult thing, to explain that what we live under is not just occupation and not just a system of racist apartheid, but we live under a system of settler colonial, uh, settler colonial structure that was designed to not only take away our land by force, but to kick us out of this land, to push mm. us out of the land, to enforce ethnic cleansing. Mm. Basically, this is the main message that I think should, the world should understand. And they should also, I mean, the good, maybe the good thing out of the many bad things that happened after 7th of October is that it brought back the attention to the root cause of the Palestinian issue. Which is? Which is the ethnic cleansing of 1948, when Israel erased to the ground 520 Palestinian communities and committed more than 50 massacres to force 70% of the Palestinian people out of their homeland mm. and becoming the Palestinian refugees. In 75 years of struggle, what was the biggest mistake Palestinians uh, made? Signing Oslo Agreement, definitely. Mm. We opposed it from the very first beginning, me and people like Haider Abdel Shafi and Edward Said and others. The problem with Oslo Agreement is that it created an illusion, as if the problem was solved. And the biggest problem of that agreement was that the Palestinians did not insist, as we asked before, on complete and total freeze of settlement activities in the West Bank. 
and Gaza. So what happened is that the number of settlers increased from 121,000 in 1993 when the agreement was signed to more than 750,000 today. They became a political force and then they became the base for what, what you see today, which is Israeli fascism. Because the system we see now is a system of fascists. People like Smotrich, who declares himself constantly as a fascist homophobe, and who said that uh, the West Bank should be filled with, West, with settlements and settlers so that Palestinians would lose any hope of a state of their own. And then they would have to choose between leaving, which is ethnic cleansing, or accepting a life of subjugation to Israelis, which is apartheid, or dying, which is exactly what they are doing now in Gaza, genocide. This is the kind of government that came up after this <coughs> settlement, settlement's growth. And that's why I think the, also the other problem was that there was an, an unequal recognition. PLO recognized Israel as a state. Israel rec recognized PLO only as a representative of Palestinians, mm. not a Palestinian state. And it was also an agreement that designed interim stages without identifying the end goal which is end of occupation. So now all this talk about two-state solution again, when uh, the UK and the US are discussing the idea of recognizing a Palestinian state, uh, will it help? No, because it's another myth. Mm -hmm. The question that should be asked to all Western governments, they speak about two-state solution already for more than 30 years. Why don't they recognize Palestine for 30 years? Why they recognize one state and not recognize the other? This is the big question. Mm. Now when they speak about recognizing the Palestinian state, they don't say what are the borders of this state, where this state will be. They don't say that it should be combined with complete Israeli el elimination of Israeli military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. They don't say that East Jerusalem should be the capital of that state. The, Israel is the only country in the world that did not define its, define its borders. Absolutely not. And one of the main acts that provoked the 7th of October is when Netanyahu in the General Assembly of the United Nations stood up and showed the map of the new Middle East, as he called it, showing Israel, annexing the whole of the West Bank all of Gaza Strip, as well as the Golan Syrian Heights. Mm. This was a message to Palestinians that I am going to normalize my relations with the Arab world mm. and your question is finished and you will never get a state. So anybody who speaks to me about a two-state solution, I want, I want him to say or her to say, what are the borders of the state you are talking about? And you should combine what you say with two things, end Israeli occupation completely and remove the Israeli illegal settlements from the occupied territories. Because without removing the Israeli illegal settlements, you can't have a solution. In the history of Palestinians, what is the biggest betrayal they got? I think the biggest betrayal is what we see today. Because some people could say that in 1948, they didn't know what was happening. Uh, they didn't see the, uh, how huge uh, was the act of ethnic cleansing that was taking place by Israel, encouraged by British colonial system. But today they know. Mm. And the biggest betrayal is the betrayal of all these Western governments and structures that have been talking to us about democracy and human rights for the last 70 years. And now they are turning a blind eye to what Israel is doing to us to three major war crimes that are happening in parallel. The war crime of ethnic cleansing, the war crime of collective punishment, and the war crime of genocide. The Western establishments made a very huge, I, can't, I don't know if I call it mistake, but a huge, huge problem by being silent about Israeli atrocities against Palestinians, by not treating us as equal human beings, by allowing Israel to mobilize racism in the West, white supremacy approach in the West, fascism and uh, Islamophobia, they practically gave us one message and gave the world a big message, which is that we don't live by international law anymore. It's the law of jungle. And anybody who has the power can do whatever they want. This will have a very, very, very serious impact on the whole world. So in my opinion, this is the biggest betrayal we were subjected to. But it's a betrayal 
not only of Palestinians, it's a betrayal of all human beings. Mm -hmm. But they are moved by their guilt uh, from the Nazi Holocaust, uh, from anti-Semitism. And we're not responsible for the Holocaust. It's they who are responsible. And by taking these actions as they do in Germany and the United States and many other places, and in Europe in particular, uh, they are actually uh, trying to push their guilt feeling on us. Mm. We who lived very well with Jewish people in, in harmony in so many Arab countries and especially in Palestine, we never had anti-Semitism. Mm. They push on us their guilt problem, but at the same time, they allow atrocity that is happening to us. And in my opinion, the same Western mind that allowed the rise of Nazism in Germany and allowed the Holocaust against Jewish people because they were weak at the time, and the same mindset that allowed anti-Semitism in Europe is the same mindset that is allowing now a Palestinian Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of approach. And they use Netanyahu, this horrible racist, they use him to free themselves from the guilt feeling of what they committed in the, in the Second World War. Those Israelis who oppress us now are not the ones who were oppressed in the Holocaust. They're different people but they abuse the memory of the Holocaust. They abuse the fact that Jewish people were subjected to terrible atrocity in the Holocaust and in the pogroms of Russia and in the anti-Semitic time in, in Europe. They abuse that memory, they abuse that heritage to oppress us. Mm. And in, in, in that way, I, I see them in the same line of those who committed Holocaust in the past. My last question, are you running for the next presidential elections when it will be announced? Look, we had presidential elections in 2005. We were supposed to get another one at least in 2009 or 2010, and we never had these elections. I hope we will have elections as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Once we have elections, I will do whatever is required from me. My, my, my goal in this life is to serve our people. I know it sounds like uh, rhetoric, but it's not rhetoric at all. This has been my life mission, to help free the Palestinian people from the oppression they have. Whatever is needed, I will do. Mm. But I am not going after a particular post or a particular position. I'm going after a particular goal, mm -hmm. which is freedom of the Palestinian people. What do you really want the world to know about you? I want them to know that I am uh, an ordinary Palestinian mm -hmm. who have been subjected to the same oppression that his people have been subjected to and who aspires to what every other people in this world aspire for, which mm -hmm. is freedom, dignity, real justice. I want them to know that I'm a fighter for justice more than anything else. And I want them to understand what the great Palestinian poet Tawfiq Zayad said once, who was the mayor of Nazareth, by the way, he once said a very nice phrase, which I like a lot. He said, we, the Palestinian people, are not better than any other people in the world. But no other people in the world is better than us. I want the world to see us as equal human beings. This is what we are missing today. Thank you very much, Mustafa Barghouti. Thank you.